Hello, everybody, and welcome. We are live. It is Wednesday. We've got Steve Hosman coming in from Boston. We've got Mary from Atlanta, people coming in from all over the world. Emily, hi there from France. And I'm not surprised. It's such an amazing show today. We are talking about something which I think we've never actually talked about before. We're talking about diplomatic global mobility. We're talking about global mobility when you're moving people who are moving in the service of their country. And this is a very unusual area. Obviously, it's different tax rules, different immigration rules, but also it's extraordinary destinations. And I'm super honored that we have no less than a very real ambassador with us on the show today. And he, Dr. Peter Tibbet, is going to be talking about his experience. He's worked in eight or nine different countries, including some of the most challenging locations on the planet. And he will take your questions and I'll be also quizzing him about his life and some things that have been going on working as an ambassador around the world. So an amazing show we've got for you today. Now you know how it all works. Please join the conversation, write in the comments box, tell us who you are, where you are, what's going on. See, so, um, we've got Faith coming in from Kenya. Well, actually, Kenya is one of the countries where our ambassadors worked. We've got uh, Simon from Dubai, from Writer Relocations. We've got Lucy from New York, uh, from York, I nearly said New York there, uh, Diane. So people coming in from the world. By the way, of course, if you want your credits, if you need HRCI credits or SHRM credits or worldwide ERC credits, I'll leave this up for a moment or two so you can take the credits out uh, and put them on your CPE. So all you have to do is screenshot this page or get your camera out and take a photo or get your pen and paper out and write down the number. But any credits you want for your CPE are there. So next week, we've got a great show lined up for you next week. Next week, of course, as I'm sure many of you know, um, is International Women's Day. And we've got a show called Women Driving Change. And it's an International Women's Day special episode. So if, like us, you want to celebrate International Women's Day, then please do join us next week as we have an amazing panel of female mobility leaders. So that's what we've got coming up. But we also like to share with you breaking news. So one of the questions I suppose people always ask me is, well, what's been going on in the last seven days in the world of global mobility? So without further ado, let me just share that. Let me just tell you what's been going on in our wonderful world of global mobility over the last seven days. So there we have it. Congratulations to everybody who has changed job, who's been promoted. Congratulations to our very own Pankaj Bhatia on his international tax diploma. And many, many congratulations to all of you. Um, I'd also like to mention that um, obviously, I think our hearts have all been touched by the earthquake that has affected so many people in Turkey and in Syria. I just want to say that uh, a service that Beneva is offering, and this is not a service that we are charging for, this is a free uh, charitable service, is if you have any people out in those regions who are having difficulty actually obtaining any cash, then we will be able to offer immediate cash transfers through our fintech solution. So if you want any help with that, you've got employees caught up in the region who need access to cash and you're trying to get it to them, then let us know and we can arrange free cash transfers and we're not charging at all for that service. And then another thing I just wanted to talk about today is actually very sad news is I wanted to uh, pay tribute to uh, the legendary Charmaine Baptista who sadly died um, just the other day. Charmaine was... 
one of the founders of Writer Relocations um, based out in Mumbai and was very much loved and respected by many people in our industry around the world. So um, we say uh, bless her and RIP to, to Charmaine Baptista. Um, what we're now going to do is we're now going to move on to talk about our regular immigration uh, segment. So if you would like to, or in fact, I urge you please now to hit the heart button, hit the like button, hit the applause button as we welcome onto stage the wonderful, the great Julia Onslow Cole. <laughs> How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Yes, very well. And you're always, every week you're somewhere different. Where, where are you this week? Well, I'm in Riyadh this week um, and I'm really, really excited because um, Alex Felstead's here and he's got a GME uh, event tomorrow, which is uh, really going to be so exciting. Lots of people have come. I see Louise Neal's here. She's um, come from London and there's um, a lot of uh, companies that are already in Riyadh who've signed up for the, the round table. And I think it'll be really interesting discussion. OK, well, a big shout out to Alex and to everybody at Global Mobility Executive. I know they do a great job with their events around the world. So uh, and good luck with that event um, for you and obviously for the GME team. So, Julia, you're going to be talking about Saudi Arabia, I guess. Yes, yes. And I just wanted to give a shout out to Mutas Shah, who's one of our team here in Riyadh. So I'm just going to very quickly in four minutes cover four really hot topics. So the first hot topic is that for companies that want to do business in Saudi, the Saudi government would really like them to set up a regional headquarters in Saudi. And if they decide not to do that, then post 2024, it may be harder for them to get a government contract. So there's lots of concessions and there is a lot of um, there is a lot of encouragement to set up regional headquarters and to qualify. You've got to have three subsidiaries outside of Saudi, one outside the MENA region. And the thing that I want to emphasize today is that. Um, you cannot use this uh, headquarters to do carry out commercial activities. It's meant to manage your, your organization. But there is some flexibility. And what we're seeing more and more is that companies are setting up a regional headquarters here, but they're just putting some of their management functions and they're leaving some outside. The second uh, thing I want to talk about is temporary work visas because there's so much happening in Saudi. It's so exciting. There's so many giga projects, the Red Sea, Neom, uh, lots and lots of opportunity for companies. And they're sending people here for very short periods of work. And the Saudi government introduced a new temporary work visa and everyone got very excited about it because it wasn't going to count against your quota, but you could actually use it to bring people to just do a little bit of work. Now, um, the thing about it is that very unfortunately, um, it was a brilliant idea, but the process is almost exactly the same as if you were going to get a full employment visa. So that means that you'd have to do legalization of documents, academic certificates, p uh, police certificates. Um, and the only uh, Saudi consulates that are actually being a bit more lenient to the UK and India so um, what we're finding is, although it's a good visa in that it doesn't require you to use up any of your quotas, it can be expensive because it's also single entry. So whilst the Saudi government is developing this and hopefully getting an easier process in place for temporary visas, some companies are actually looking at it and saying, well, is it more cost effective, even if my quota is going to be impacted, to just put someone on an employment visa? And I just wanted to throw that out there. The third thing I wanted to talk about was Saudiization. 
So we talked last week when I was in Dubai about the whole region looking very carefully at its own citizens and very rightly wanting to make sure that they um, have to jobs to and them to give make sure they've got priority that, that yes that they fine. that they have priority and yeah. interestingly enough Brian some jobs are classified that they can only be held by Saudi citizens and a lot of the global mobility jobs in fact HR director payroll talent acquisition all of these have to be held by Saudi citizens but the point I want to make today is that the the Nitikart system is very, very complex. And it's not just one quota for your company, but there's quotas by professional sector. So I'm not sure what the legal sector is. I think it's about 70%. But that would mean that if you had a company, you'd have one quota for your whole company. And then if you had a legal department, you'd have a separate quota, a much higher quota for your lawyers. So it is very complex and, um, you know, people really are struggling with it. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is premium residency. There are two ways at the moment that you can come into Saudi and gain pre premium residency. Um, one is if you pay an annual fee, which is about equivalent to about 26,000 US dollars. It's 100,000 Saudi reals or a lifetime fee, which is 800,000 Saudi reals, which is about 208,000 US dollars. Um, but the government in Saudi is looking at introducing some sort of gold and green visas like, like Dubai, and they will be lasting for five to 10 years. And it's possible that they might be linked to you having a regional headquarters here. So I wanted to flag that because that's a really exciting development. And it would mean maybe your C-suite could get on, uh, you know, a slightly more flexible and different visa. OK, so, Julia, thank you very, very much as ever. That'd be Where are you going to be next week? Uh, London. OK, right. Um, OK, so, Julia... Many thanks for your update. We're now going to move on to tax. So um, everybody hit the heart button, hit the like button, hit the applause button. And let's say a big thank you to Julia Onslow Cole and a big welcome to Julie Barron. <laughs>
in yeah. the outer premises. So uh, sooner or later it may touch you. Right now it touches Poland and Polish employees. Um, if you have the employees that from time to time or entirely the, is, they are working from home, uh, as of the 7th of April, you need to be prepared for some changes as employers. It's important the new law introduces the definition of the remote work. That's the first point. And also introduces a number of um, obligations to be imposed on the employers who have the employees working from home. And my uh, today, uh, words will be about these employers' obligations. Each individual um, employer that uh, has the employee working from home uh, is obliged to provide to the employees uh, working remotely materials, tools, and the technological devices that may be necessary to perform work uh, from home. So it's really, really important, and it also may be a extra burden on cost to be taken into account if you've got the employees in Poland. It's also important that uh, the employers in Poland will be obliged in such circumstances to cover the costs uh, that are directly relating to performance of uh, remote work in Poland. Um, such an obligation needs to be somehow specified in any kind of an arrangement made between the uh, either the employee and the employer or in case of, I would say, um, uh, remuneration regulations or any rules which are adopted by the, by the companies in Poland. So it's important. It's not only about the fact that um, there are the regulations in terms of, um, of allowing the employees to work from home, giving them proper tools, but it's also about the putting regular regulations how this work will be performed. Actually, if you've got the employees working in such hybrid model, um, virtually or remotely, in any case, you will need to have kind of a conclusion between the employer and the employee uh, uh, where they would be the conditions of working remotely agreed. What is important, it's also on the safety and uh, health conditions um, of uh, work performed outside of any office. Until now, during maybe pandemic times, it was um, much easier and much simplified. If you have the employees working remotely, um, obviously you were to a certain extent responsible for the conditions in which they are performing work, Right now, it needs to be somehow agreed between the employer and the employee in what conditions the employee will be performing work. And uh, you need somehow ensure uh, any training and a technical support the employees may require uh, in terms of uh, working from uh, uh, from home. It's important. I am a tax person. I am doing the uh, tax calculations for the employees and employers for, for, for many cases. If you are to reimburse the cost of work from home to the employee, as you are um, uh, obliged under the law, you need to remember that such reimbursements are exempt, will be exempt from tax and social security in Poland. But it is important that there is the proper value distributed to the employees in Poland. So in any case, apart from agreeing with the employee that the employee will be working from home, uh, the companies in Poland will also need to somehow ensure that the proper amount is distributed to the employee working from home. Okay, I think, yeah. I, I, so basically the message here though is that if you've got employees working in Poland and they're remote working, then you really do need to take advice because these changes are going to be pretty, pretty far-reaching. Far yeah, it's important uh, indeed because we will need to agree with the employee where he or she will be working. It's important. Yeah. And we will need to agree the tools, the devices needed, and finally agree the pro on the proper reimbursement of costs and also make it alive. So all the operational staff from, you know, counting where the employee is, determine the fact uh, whether he or she was working from home or from the office, and then distributing proper amount of money as reimbursement. So uh, challenges in yep. front of the poly employers in Poland, but on the other hand, we've got the regulations. It's the important message you need to take uh, away from today. Absolutely. 7th of April is the date in which you potentially will need to start Second of uh, April, yeah. Okay. Seventh of April. Seventh of April. Seventh of April. So, okay, so everybody out there, um, 
if you, this sounds like if you've got Polish employees, you really need to understand the issue and reach out to uh, Vialto Partners or whoever your normal tax advisor is, reach out and make sure that that is an area that you've covered. Thank you so much, Julie and Chad Wieger. We're now going to move on to talk about uh, something very exciting that we're launching, which is the Top 100 Diversity Initiative. And to do that, I'm going to bring our producer, Tally Gorin, onto the stage. So everybody, let's do a really big thank you to Julie and Jad Wieger for that really important update from Poland. So everybody, hit the heart button, hit the like button, hit the applause button, and let's say thank you to Julie and Jad Wieger and welcome to Tally as she starts telling us about the Top 100 Diversity Initiative. Hello, Brian. Hi. I just want to give a shout out, actually. We've got a new logo up there in terms of our partner organizations. We've got ITX up there who are specialists in global employment companies. I saw Simon Davis in our audience today. So big shout out to Simon and everybody at ITX. So Tally, tell us, it's exciting because today's the day that we're launching. So tell us. Yes, about yes, yes, yes. And, and I wanted to stress that diversity um, is such a wide concept and we really call, call calling all kind of uh, uh, diversity initiatives, if it's training programs, if it's uh, inclusive, uh, inclusive uh, workplace policies or uh, uh, diversity recruitment initiatives, anything that you can think of. And the other uh, exciting difference is going to be this, uh, uh, we've set up this in this uh, uh, time, is that although the nominees should be corporate only, so global mobility uh, diversity champions from corporates, but uh, the nominators can be everyone. So it could be vendors, could be suppliers, and, and of course could be corporate. And if you want uh, your nominee to know that you've nominated them, now it's your chance to be, uh, to be known. So we have uh, in the nomination form, which uh, you can see here, the link, and I'm going to share it. Uh, we have a place for you to tick saying that, yes, I want to be mentioned. And your nominee will know that you were the one who nominated them. So that's, that's the most exciting news. And Brian, um, you already uh, shared, okay, the next one is the CoreFlex benchmark uh, survey, uh, which we just uh, just published and we invite everyone to participate. It's a very brief uh, survey that is focused on CoreFlex mobility policies. And we want to see uh, uh, and, and to create a summary report um, with the comment, uh, uh, comment practices uh, in structuring and administration of CoreFlex. Uh, I'm going to again share the link to the um, to the survey and the participant, participants in the survey will actually receive early access to the summary report. Um, the I'm next sure news... We'll in a few weeks' time as well. Sorry? Yeah, we're going to have a... Okay, so so the, the survey is going to close on Friday, March 10th. And then on the 22nd, after we get the results and we process them, we're going to have a show with Russ, uh, who's running uh, uh, from advisory board, that is running this survey, and with uh, uh, Dawn Sperling. Uh, they're going to do a show and we'll bring up these, uh, the survey uh, results. So that would be very exciting. Um, the next thing, actually, you already mentioned, so I will also share the link um, uh, for this initiative by Benivo, it's uh, similar to what we had uh, during the, the beginning of the war uh, in the Ukraine and uh, um, definitely use that. Uh, it has no fees, no charges, and it's for everyone, not just uh, Benivo clients. So just contact us and do use that to transfer money to your employees in, uh, in Syria or in Turkey. 
And the last thing I want to mention again, and I saw that we have, uh, um, I saw some some of our um, change makers in the in the audience. So hi, Mena, Sky, Nicole. I see I've seen you there. And anyone who's uh, coming to FEM, you're invited to a happy hour with uh, and meet with Beth, our Penibos Beth, um, at the Bar Bocas Cafe. So do let us know. And again, I'll share the link uh, to let us know that you're going to be there. And we're hoping to see you. Okay, so Tally, thank you so much. And thank you as ever for all your hard work. Now, we are super delighted and super honored that we have a real live ambassador on the show today. And there's gonna be all sorts of questions I'm sure you want to ask. So don't be shy, put them in the comments box and we'll try and ask all the questions that we can. But we're gonna talk about a very, very different sort of expat. I mean, we've talked about interns, we've talked about junior expats, we've talked about managers, we've talked about VIPs, but we never actually talked about people who are going abroad in their service of their country, representing their, their, their governments. So without further ado, we're going to bring on stage uh, Dr. Peter Tibber, a former ambassador from Britain to, well, many different countries. And we're going to be finding all about his fascinating career and lifestyle and some of the issues and challenges that diplomatic staff face. So everybody hit the heart button, hit the like button, hit the applause button, and let's bring on stage Dr. Peter Tibber. <laughs> Hey, Peter, welcome to the show. We are so honored and excited to have you here. So, Peter, just tell us a bit about yourself. I mean, we showed that video, and I think I've ever put up so many countries on a video, but tell us a bit about where you've worked during your amazing, amazing career. Well, first of all, Brian, thank you so much for inviting me on the show. It's a real pleasure and privilege to be with you. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward very much to talking a little bit about my career, but above all, hearing your questions and the questions from some of your viewers. Uh, yeah, I spent 35 years in the British diplomatic service. Um, about 10 of those years were spent in the UK. And the rest were spent um, moving around the world. I started in France for a couple of years. I moved from France to uh, Turkey, from uh, Turkey to Mexico. Then I had a, um, a spell in the UK. Um, and then I went out to Germany, to Pakistan, um, short stay in Kenya, uh, Sudan, and finally Colombia, which I left in 2019, towards the end of 2019, that was the end of my diplomatic career and my last diplomatic posting. Okay, so that's nine countries I think you've, you've, you've worked on, which is quite extraordinary. Which, what was your favourite? Yeah, well, so Brian, diplomats are good at deflecting <laughs> that kind of question. Uh, they all had something really great to offer. Um, we travelled with our family. Um, so some countries were, you know, were uh, countries we experienced as a family, others were countries we experienced uh, as, as a couple. And I think there's a mindset about traveling. You know, if you go out to any country in the world, uh, determined to enjoy it, determined to discover it, determined to make the most of the strange and very different and very challenging environments in which you find yourself, you're going to make a success of it. Uh, and I can honestly say that each and every one of the postings that I was on, um, gave me something to uh, to bring back, something to treasure, something to remember. So here I am trying to um, make you say something undiplomatic and failing miser miserably. I, I might try again later and see whether we can, <laughs> we, can, we can do it. And out in the audience, if you've got questions for Peter about any of those locations or about the career of being a, a diplomat, then just shove them in the comments box and we'll try and ask those, those questions. But Peter, just tell me, I mean, you worked for the British 
uh, diplomatic service, British Foreign Office. How does that compare to other countries? Do other countries, do all countries do it the same way or is it very different the way different countries run their ambassadors? So I, uh, uh, different countries do it in different ways. Um, the first thing perhaps to say about the UK diplomatic service is that it's uh, one of the biggest in the world. Um, it had well over uh, 200 um, posts um, in different countries around the world, several posts in, in, in some countries, of, of course. It is with, uh, you know, one or two, literally, exceptions, entirely professional. So um, uh, people like me uh, join the service um, and uh, sort of progress through the ranks. And if we're, we're fortunate, um, finish as uh, ambassadors or in senior positions, there are virtually no uh, political um, appointments. Um, and it's very thematic. So as one develops uh, in a career, one develops certain themes, certain areas of, of specialization, which tend to uh, determine where you might go. So uh, in particular language, of course, uh, but also uh, thematic specialisations in uh, commercial work, in, in supporting British business overseas, in looking after British citizens overseas, in uh, conflict uh, prevention, in environmental themes and so on. So I think it's a really um, professional organisation in, in both senses, of professional in the sense of being really good technically, but also in the sense of being apolitical. Okay, so um, you mentioned languages, actually, and I know you're actually you're a bit of a, a, a linguist your, your, yourself. You studied languages. Uh, and, um, and here's a question from Simon Davies. Uh, he says, how much emphasis do you put on learning the language of the location you are in? And a great deal is, is, is the short answer. I've only, I think, once been in a country where I really didn't speak the, the local language, which was uh, Sudan, where the, the local language is, is Arabic. Um, and uh, knowing the language is of enormous value. It's not just the communication, which of course is important, but as you learn a language, you learn a culture, you learn a way of thinking, you learn the reference points of the country and of the people to which you're going. And you simply understand uh, much better and much more deeply the country in which you are working. So the Foreign Office, rightly, in my view, puts an enormous effort into ensuring that as many diplomats as possible speak the language of the country to which they are posted. Not everyone does, but, but many, many do. Um, and effort goes in not just to teaching uh, diplomats those languages, but keeping them up to speed. OK, we're getting loads of questions coming in. Here, here's another one from uh, Mark Dirksen. He says, Peter, if you could do it all over again, what would you do differently? Well, there's a great question. I mean, the first thing to say is, you know, so I, I had a career of 35 years, which finished two or three years ago. So, you know, we've been through a communications revolution in that period. You know, when I started, um, you know, there was no social media. Uh, communication back to base was by um, sort of slow uh, electronic means. Um, and um, so, so the, the, my career has evolved, the way in which I've worked has, has evolved um, enormously from a technical point of view. And the other thing I would say is that it's changed really in um, the sense of valuing people. The Foreign Office and the Diplomatic Service is a far more diverse organization than ever it was in the sort of mid 1980s when, when I joined. It's much more open, in indeed encouraging seeking out um, gender, ba gender balance, uh, ethnic minorities um, and specific skills. It's much, it's, its culture is very much broader and wider than it, than it used to be. So I think the answer to the question is, if I was going to start again, I would want to start from where we are now rather than where we were 30 years ago. Because the world is just so, so different. I'm getting so many questions coming coming in here. We had some prepared that when we were chatting earlier, but um, there's, these are much better. So <laughs> I'll, take, I'll take the questions from, from the audience. Here's one from uh, my old friend, Ed Cohen, out in San Diego. And he says, uh, was security ever an issue for you or your family? And if yes, please describe. And I know that it, it certainly was in some of the stories that... Uh, that you've told me, and just so the audience know, you were 
you were actually in Pakistan when um, representing the British when uh, Bin Laden was was shot. Uh, you worked with the Turkish ambassador at, at a time when I think you weren't there at the time at a time when he was assassinated. Um, and you've been in some pretty tough countries like uh, Sudan uh, uh, as well. So tell us about security, an issue for you and indeed your, your family. You make me sound like a bad omen, Brian. You know, anywhere I turn up, somebody's going to get shot. It wasn't quite like that. It's great to have all these questions. Um, so security was a big, a big issue for me. I mean, of course, you know, the Foreign Office as a responsible organisation needs to look after its people who are sent out to some uh, very difficult environments. And in the last um, sort of 10 years or so of my career, I was accompanied 24-7 by a close protection team. Uh, in some places, so in uh, uh, Sudan. I think Colombia and Pakistan. Sudan. And, yeah, and Colombia, in Sudan, Sudan. Pakistan, it was basically a local team, but trained and led uh, by British military police. And in Colombia, it was a UK-based, uh, a, a local team as well, sorry. In Sudan, it was UK-based team. In Pakistan and Colombia, they were, they were local. So well, I had the... So they were sort of staying in your house with you? Well, the time. exact circumstances uh, uh, changed. Um, but um, in in Sudan and in um, Colombia, yes, they uh, one or two of them spent uh, the night in our house. In Pakistan, the arrangements were a bit different because the where I was living was on a diplomatic compound, which was itself protected. But what it meant was that I couldn't go anywhere in the country uh, whether for personal or for professional reasons, without being uh, accompanied by a protection team who had to prepare the ground uh, in advance. Uh, I had to travel in uh, armoured vehicles, uh, and there was a risk assessment of everywhere I went. And in one sense, that is hugely reassuring, because there were obvious um, security dangers and threats out there. In another sense, it's an enormous imposition because um, these were all great guys, they were all very professional, they were all very discreet. Um, I had great admiration for what they, what they did, what they do, but I just didn't want to be with them 24-7. Uh, and we all have moments in our lives when, you know, we want to be alone or we just want to be with our families. And of course, in the security, in the privacy of my house, that was fine, but as soon as I stepped outside the door, um, there they were. So that really was uh, quite a strain, a necessary strain. And sadly, you know, this is more and more the case that in parts of the world, this kind of level of protection is necessary. And I think you said to me, we were chatting earlier about this, um, which I found quite extraordinary, is that, dip, that close protection only applied to you. It didn't apply if your wife or your kids, and I'd like to talk about uh, your, your wife, Ev, and, and, and your kids, you know, from their perspective, but so the protection only applied to you. So your wife, Ev, could just go out as, uh, pretty much as she wanted. Yes, the rationale was that if it was too dangerous for a diplomat's partner to accompany him or her without security protection, then that partner shouldn't be in post. And there were some, there are some, a number of places where um, diplomats have to go out um, unaccompanied by their families. And in fact, in Pakistan, that happened to me because although the security situation would have allowed my wife to come with me, uh, it wouldn't have allowed uh, any of our children. And our youngest child was still at school, uh, couldn't come to Pakistan, and my wife therefore stayed, stayed with him in the UK. Um, but in other places, in Sudan um, and in uh, Colombia, as you've just said, uh, I had the protection, uh, she did not. And she was much freer than I was uh, to go out um, by herself, wherever she wanted, um, uh, driving herself uh, and so on. There were general security provisions and advice which applied to all diplomats, indeed all UK, UK citizens in whatever country it was, and she needed to respect those. But there was nothing specific for her. And it was indeed rather incongruous. And on many occasions, we decided that if she needed or wanted to go somewhere, then I needed or wanted to go there as well. And then she benefited from the security envelope. 
Okay. But what is it like? You go to a country for the first time. Now, normally when we're talking about, if you like, our traditional assignees, they go out, they do a look-see visit, they go out, they go into temporary accommodation somewhere, they look for some accommodation, and then they find somewhere and maybe they get destination services, someone showing them around, showing them the schools, showing them, you know, the different areas. How does it work for you? Or do you just move into some the previous incumbent's house? Or I mean, how, how does it work when you're moving like that for your for your government? Well, again, circumstances uh, vary in in many countries in the world. Um, the British government owns property. Um, for its its diplomats and it wants to use that property so you've jolly well got to move into it and if you're an ambassador or head of mission then there will be a formal residence for you which is partly your home but which is principally actually the uh, premier hospitality venue for the British government in that country and you've jolly well got to live there um, and that creates issues as well because you're living in a a place which might in part be your home, but which is also very much part of the professional estate uh, and a big promotional tool for uh, the British government in, in that country. But if you're not in that position and you're just coming as a as a as a as a, as a diplomat, then circumstances vary. Usually, um, you get off the plane, you're you're met, you're taken to some kind of temporary accommodation, which could be a service department or a hotel, could be the property of the guy you're taking over from um, and then yeah you'd be given some sort of support maybe by the embassy uh, or maybe by hired in professional uh, services um, to find a house or a home that suits you um, to find um, sort out your schooling and and so on the level of support varies enormously frankly and in some places we found it much better than in others but that reflected the circumstances of the country as well. You know, if you go to Germany, it's pretty easy to sort yourself out. If you go to Pakistan, it's much more difficult. And when you travelled with your kids, presumably they went to international schools. Now, by way of background, your 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 wife is originally French, and and your kids went to French international schools, didn't? didn't... Yes, Did be... they went to French. They went to French schools. I mean, I, in, in my experience, the 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 the, the the concept of an international school is, is a misnomer. Uh, I mean, they're not I international. They're international in the sense that there may be people from many nationalities there, um, but they usually have a, um, a dominant culture of one or the other, very often American, sometimes uh, British. Um, and calling them international schools implies that they're a bit more neutral, I think, than in than reality they are. Our kids went to French schools. They were very definitely French, they taught the French curriculum, they taught it in French, um, but there were a lot of um, pupils in those schools who came from the local country or from, or from elsewhere. And that system worked very well for us. There's been a really interesting switch, you know, in, in, in mentality. I think sort of 50 years ago, uh, many people joined the Foreign Office because they knew that the Foreign Office would pay for their children to go to boarding school, which is what they wanted to do in any case. And by joining the Foreign Office, they were relieved of some of the fees. So the boarding school arrangement was seen as a bonus. I think, you know, the culture is very, very different now. And many, if not most parents, do not want to send their children to boarding school. It seems your, as a... Your, as a your children children. travelled with you everywhere you went? Exactly. And that's much more common now for, for children uh, to accompany their parents and to be schooled locally where they can, you know, where the schools are available and, and where the security situation allows. And of course, in many places, neither of those things hold. Okay. We quite often in the mobility industry talk about third culture kids, kids who are, um, you know, not the culture of the home country, not the culture of the host country, but a culture somewhere in between because they were they went to an international school, they grew up as expats. Now, your kids were, you know, pretty unique in the sense that they didn't just experience in one country, they experienced international assignments in, uh, maybe it wasn't nine, because I appreciate some of the later ones, they may not have come with you, but let's say, you know, seven or six or seven different countries. How do you think that has you know, blended them as as their adults now, as, as, as adults, you know, what do you think their outlook is uh, on, on the world? And I don't know if they're watching or not, but if they are, shout out to them. Uh, but how do you think, you know, 
how do you think it's, it's, it's blended their outlook on, on, on the world, having lived in so many different countries in their formative years? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, of course, I, I don't know the answer because I don't know what they might have been had, had they not had that experience. Um, and I do think that I have I have three children, three boys, and I think that you know they reacted in 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 different ways and took different things from the experience. I think it welded us as a very tight knit family unit, um, and that has continued. I think it made them aware very early on uh, of issues around um, cultural difference, diversity. Uh, and understanding, um, you know, that the world was not just as they had experienced it, but, but there were many, many different experiences out there. I think it made them uh, open to new experiences, new relationships. Uh, I think it challenged them because uh, every three or four years they would be pulled up by the roots and, and move somewhere else. And obviously, you know, that's that's difficult for any human being, maybe particularly difficult for children. And remember, I'm talking about a period mainly before social media. So just keeping in touch through Facebook and the rest wasn't an option. Um, and I think, therefore, it gave them a degree of uh, resilience and independence, um, both of being and of thought, um, which have seen them um, very well subsequently. And some of them, the three, are quite keen, I think, in um, traveling and maybe having an overseas experience, and some of them very definitely are not. Okay, and let's talk about it from uh, your wife, from Ev's perspective, because when you were in all these countries, you know, you were working, and as you became more senior, you were gradually the bigger and bigger, ultimately the big shot, you know, in, in, in the embassy. Uh, your kids, of course, they were busy in school, um, but your wife was the if you like the ambassador's wife or the diplomat's wife and i suspect there might have been restrictions on what she could do in terms of working and again she was being uprooted every few years so what's the experience like for um the the diplomat's partner or, or, or spouse in, in terms of ability to work and how they fit into the culture where they're where they're going and indeed what they do with their day well so she's a she's an economist um, by um, by training and profession, and um, taught uh, economics in um, several of the countries to which we were posted. Um, she taught in private colleges. She taught at a U.S. college. She taught uh, with a with a campus in in Mexico. Um, she taught in a German university. She taught in a Turkish university. Um, so she was quite. Um, uh, creative and persistent, and I suppose lucky maybe, in finding employment opportunities. Um, she was, um, she's just appeared in the background. Oh, I think we can, we can see her in the background. <laughs> I always describes it as a series of yeah, jobs yeah, rather than... Yeah. She described it as a series of jobs rather than as a career, because like everybody yeah. else, she was picked up by the uh, by the roots. And, you know, there were complications in some countries. She was not allowed to work uh, and therefore didn't. In other countries, she was not allowed to work, but we found workarounds and she did. And some countries were much more open to the idea of diplomatic spouses working. What was not available to her, but which is now much more available and much more common, is to work, is to retain your UK based job and to work remotely. Um, and there is quite a lot of that now in the uh, diplomatic service, not least because it is quite often the case that it is the diplomatic spouse who is the principal earner. Um, so, you know, people, couples, families don't want to give up, up that, that income stream. And once I became uh, ambassador, it got a bit more difficult um, because of the public profile, because of the security issues. Uh, and uh, she, at that point, discontinued her career as an economist, um, but then sort of ran the, the residences in which we live, which, as I say, uh, functioned only partially as a home and principally as a kind of hospitality um, venue for promoting the UK 
And she did that both on a voluntary basis and eventually uh, on a full time employee basis. So give me an idea. I mean, you know, I think we've probably all got pictures in our mind of, you know, the ambassadorial residence and the life. And I'm imagining like sort of big ballrooms and then presumably private apartments. Somewhere. How many staff when you were the ambassador, you know, and you were in I'm not talking about the embassy itself. I'm talking about the ambassadorial residence. Um, how many staff would you have had look, looking after you? Well, they weren't looking after me. I mean, some of them were, um, but they were looking after the residents and, and you know, providing the services that we had to had to supply. So typically, for example, yeah, exactly. So if you take the example of my last post in, in, in Colombia, there were, you know, half a dozen staff. Um, you know, there was there was a, um, you know, there was a cook uh, and sometimes an assistant. Uh, there was, you know, there were there were um, uh, waiters people who, who, who served um there was a gardener um and we you know we ran i don't know three or four events a week which could be anything from a you know a private breakfast for one or two people um to a reception for you know 100 or more or 200 or you know, 500 on some occasions and they all had to be to a high standard so that people you know knew they were being treated specially and um appreciated a uh, an invite to the home of the of the british ambassador so i you know they it's less a question of what they were doing for me as simply start you know staffing as i say a classy restaurant or a, or a classy hotel and the number of staff depended on the size of the embassy, uh, the outreach of the embassy, um, the circumstances of the of the, of the, of the country, um, security issues in both Pakistan and Sudan when I were there meant that uh, inviting people to the house was was quite complicated. The houses themselves were extremely well protected, um, yes, and security. in those pardon. So there's a lot of security just to come into the, the house. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of security. And, you know, there's, there's diff in a country like, you know, in France or Germany, we could do quite a lot ourselves in, because we, you know, they're European countries and we basically understand the system. Um, in, in Pakistan or, or Sudan, uh, we don't. So we have to rely far more on local employees of the embassy and of the residents to do it for us. So if you just wanted to invite a friend over for, for dinner or your wife, your kids want to invite a friend over to dinner or to watch a, a movie or something, then they had to go through some sort of vetting before they were allowed in, in, into the building? Well, not, not. I mean, first of all, the children wouldn't have been in a, in a, in a, in a country where the security situation was really difficult. Um, no, they'd have. To, I mean, they 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 come through a security gate. That would be a, that would be about it, really. You know, there was there was plenty of freedom for for that, and and the kids did indeed. You know, when we were in Turkey, for example, or Mexico, you know, they they went to the local schools. They had local friends, and they and they brought them back and and, and went to them. And of course, you know, I've talked mainly about about uh, the political security threat, but in places like Mexico, for example, there was a huge threat of, of, of criminality. So we weren't worried about sort of political, politically motivated crime, but just, you know, kids being kidnapped um, as they, you know, whether they were Mexicans or British or anything else. So you had to keep your beady eyes out for them. And even if they went to play with the with the with the uh, the children of the neighbor next door, you know, we watched them go out of the house along the road and into the next house, because you never know whether when something nasty might happen to them. Okay. Oh, we found in the audience a global mobility manager uh, who's also been uh, in your in your sector. So I don't know if you know Louise Luke. She says, I'm the wife of a former diplomat slash ex-high commissioner and also a global mobility manager. My experience with three overseas postings with the FCO, that's the Foreign and Colonial Office, which is the, the British Diplomatic Office, uh, has been invaluable in my own career. So there we're, we're marrying the two. Louise, interested, we'd be interested to hear more from you uh, about what... Uh, I hope she agrees with what I said. Yeah, <laughs> well, we hope, hopefully you, 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 you do. Um, but if, if you don't, I'm sure people remain diplomatic as he, as, as he always is. Now, I just want to turn it around... <laughs> Um, actually, I've got a couple of questions. One is, just a silly question, is doing three events a week, have you managed to stay so slim? I just, I just wonder about that. 
think you may have frozen. Um, swimming is the answer. Oh, right. So I, I did a lot of swimming and I went easy on the desserts. Oh, that's the secret. Don't eat the desserts. Okay. And another question I want to ask, we're getting towards the end yeah. of our time, is what about um, when you come back? Because you've experienced so many different cultures um, and you've had, all, you know, all these staff and events. And I mean, the world has been so busy and you've been at the center of so many of the most important events, you know, of our, of our lives. What's it like when you come back? What, what's the reverse culture shock like of, of, of sort of, Re or I was going to say reintegrating out, but that's not the right phrase, um, of, of, of reintegrating back into normal, the normal world. I think we're having a connection problem here. So I had a career of, of 30 plus years. Um, I enjoyed it very much. Um, I got a great deal out of it. You know, I was ready to move on. And to be honest, uh, coming back to normality, inverted commas, in the UK uh, was a it, it meant I no longer had a security detail with me the whole time. It meant I was no longer on show. Uh, it meant that I could um, see and be hospitable with people who I wanted to be, who I wanted to see and wanted to be hospitable with rather than people that I needed to uh, for my work. Um, and as I think you know, I had a big personal project that was uh, coming to fruition and I was very enthusiastic about getting engaged with that. So, um, you know, I enjoyed it while I was doing it, um, but I enjoyed the fact that it came to an end uh, and that I'm now doing something else. Okay, and so Peter, we're pretty much coming to a, an end now, but I just wanted to thank you for, uh, and I, on behalf of all the audience, some fascinating stories. People I know have absolutely loved it. I see Lauren's written fascinating stories. Uh, Clivia said, thank you for the insight into the world of an ambassador. Uh, Brian Loud said, great guest today, very interesting, well done. So um, lots of positive comments. I'm gonna bring our other guests back onto screen now. So we've got Julie, we've got Julia, We've got Jadwiga, and of course we've got Tally. So uh, Peter, that has been just the most fascinating mm -hmm. insight. And um, as Claire says, this has been very interesting. Thank you, Beniva, for helping everyone to see some different views from the top. And certainly it really is, uh, you know, a, a, almost like an ultimate view from the top. And Rob Zeit's very interesting, thanks. Um, it's been great. We're back next week, and next week we're gonna be talking about uh, women in leadership. It, it's International Women's Day, and we've got a great panel. Uh, a panel there, uh, Julia. And I mean, you, you've been hearing this. You've been working in the immigration field. Uh, any, any, and, and Julia. I mean, obviously, immigration tax don't apply in these circumstances. But any, any final thoughts from what what you've heard? Yes, I think I actually have been sending loads of emails to uh, the Permits Foundation because I know they would just so love to. Um, have some time with Peter and also follow up with with lots of the comments because I think the point you're making about um, being allowed to work and having permission to work and in some countries we you know diplomats partners can't even do charitable things you know they're not even allowed to do that under the immigration rules so um, you know th this is a really big hot topic um, for immigration, but it was it was a fascinating fascinating uh, hour, and thank you so much for sharing your experiences. And Julie, from a tax point of view, as I understand it, as a diplomat, uh, basically it's as if you haven't moved; you just remain subject to domestic tax, and you don't pay any any local. Yeah, tax. that's right. But I have to tell you that here in DC, we often are dealing with the spouses of some of the diplomats or people working in the embassy. So we've had some um, interesting issues with that because of based on whatever visa they may be working on, what does that mean for their tax situation? So um, yeah, there's some complexities there that we've dealt with. So it is interesting. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone. I think We're you guys have the, the diplomat and diplomatic spouses uh, need. So it's, it's great to meet up with you and I've enjoyed very much sharing this conversation. Yeah. Peter, we've absolutely loved having you on the show. Um, 
and hopefully I'll, I'll see, you, see you soon. And everybody, that's the end of our hour. We are back next week on The View from the Top, as I said, talking about women in leadership for International Women's Day. Thank you, everybody. And it's goodbye for me and it's goodbye from all our guests. Goodbye.